Uber driver tips and Lyft driver tips, where I give you Uber tips and Lyft tips to help you make more money, get high ratings, and overall have a way better time driving for Lyft and driving for Uber. On this video, the pro tip I wanna give you is 4 a.m. Now I have to be honest, I'm always transparent in all my videos. I never did this because the idea of waking up and driving at 4 a.m., just not for me. <laughs> just being honest, not for me. However, I cannot tell you how many drivers I've talked to an insane amount of anything. I almost find it's almost like a coin flip where if I talk to a driver saying, oh, so you drive for Lyft and Uber, when do you drive, how do you drive, et cetera, et cetera. About half the time, a lot of them say, well, you know what? I'm not gonna lie. I love waking up at like 3.30 a.m. You know, I, I go to bed super early. I wake up at like 3.30 or maybe even like 3.45. I then start driving at four and I drive from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. A lot of drivers make an insane amount of money during those times. People are going to the airport. So especially from like 4 a.m. to about like, I'd say 7 a.m., you are doing all these airport rides. And as we all know, airport rides typically pay a lot of money. So from 4 a.m. to about 7-ish a.m., you're doing airport rides or some really early morning rides. And then around 7-ish a.m., you're now hitting the morning commutes. So then from seven to nine, you're doing about the morning commutes. So they tell me they'll drive from 4 a.m. to the 9 a.m., depending on how the surges are going and how everything's kind of moving. And then after that, they get done. And guess what? They're now done driving completely. Their entire day is now completely open. It's 10 a.m. They have the entire day to do whatever they want. This is a massive one, honestly, not just for rideshare driving, but for having a car in general. Make sure you get a triple A card. Triple A is an incredible service. And the amount of money you're going to spend getting a AAA card and having that membership is well worth it in terms of the benefits. If anything happens, your car breaks down, you need a jump, uh, you have a flat tire, it needs to get towed somewhere. The amount of money you're going to spend on that AAA membership is well worth it to get your car fixed, sometimes right then and there. Obviously, if you have a more technical or difficult situation that's more extensive in terms of the work, you're going to have to get it towed. But in all these situations, if something happens to your car, AAA is there when you need it. It's very similar to insurance in the sense that hopefully you ever don't have to use it because it's really only in dire situations. But if you do need to use it, it is there. I might as well say this too. I have no affiliation with AAA. They did not ask me to make this video. I'm getting no kickbacks, no endorsements, nothing. I've personally used AAA tons of times. And like I said, the amount of money you're going to spend is well worth it, not only to make the situation easier, right, for them to come right there, they drive right to you and help you with your problem, but also getting back out on the road. If you don't have AAA and let's say something happens to your car, well, you're going to have to call a tow company, you're going to have to bring it to a mechanic, you might lose an entire night's worth of work, which is going to be very expensive. However, if you have AAA, like I said, you call them, they come right to you, if they can fix your problem right then and there, and you'd be surprised what they can do just right there with their truck and the tools they have, if they can fix it, even just one instance of you being able to use AAA and not missing a night's worth of work can be the exact cost of the membership itself, or if anything, you're gonna make more money and still come out on top just of one night of not missing work. Trust me, whether you are a rider driver or not, make sure you get AAA. For this pro tip, I wanna talk about having a terminal list. Now, if you're driving in an area where you know you're going to the airport a lot, it's not a bad idea, it could take you two seconds to print it out, whether it's at your house or maybe at the store like FedEx or whatever, to print out the list of airlines and the terminals that each one is in. I actually saw this when I was in Uber, I was actually heading to LAX, not this time, but it was a different time, and on the back of the chair, it had all the airlines, whether it's my case, American Airlines or Delta, JetBlue, Spirit, whatever the case is, and showed you exactly which airline was in each terminal. Now, being honest, most of the time when you're driving someone to the airport, they're already know, they might even already put it into the app saying like LAX Terminal 3, for example. However, I cannot tell you how many times when driving, people will be like, wait, I'm JetBlue, but I don't, I don't remember what terminal it is, or I'm United, I honestly, you know what, let me, let me try my ticket and they don't know. So it's not a bad idea just to have that list. It could take you, like I said, again, two seconds and it really does improve customer service. This one is a staple and that is doing the app bounce. Now, first up, I'll give you almost a beginning pro tip and then get into this pro tip. And that is sign up with both apps. I still am in shock when I talk to people who drive and they're like, oh yeah, I only drive for Uber or I only drive for Lyft. Sign up with both. It doesn't cost you any money. It's completely free to do. 
And in addition, in case you don't know, there's no quota. You don't have to have a quota when driving for Lyft or Uber. Just sign up with both apps. Now, in terms of this pro tip, getting into it, the app bounce, what I'm talking about, especially on peak nights, so let's say Friday and Saturday nights, is to have both apps open at the exact same time and bounce between them. The reason why is let's say you're like Mark, but in my area, and obviously this depends location to location, in my area, Uber pays more or Lyft pays more. Well, that may be true overall, you never know. Let's say on a Friday night, for whatever reason, let's say Uber is very common in your area, maybe on a Friday night, on that particular Friday night, there's not that many Lyft drivers, the surge rates are super high and they're paying a good amount, or let's say they're having some type of bonus that night, we'll then drive for Lyft. And even in the same night, even if you're like, well, Uber's paying more, I will still have both apps open and I almost have, I'd say four apps. I know it can be kind of chaotic, but this is a way to make a lot of money. I'll have the Uber app open, the Lyft app open, Google Maps, because obviously that's the best GPS in my opinion, and then some type of like music player, whether it's Spotify, Pandora, whatever the case is. And the second, let's say I get a ride with Uber, let's say it looks like a really good ride, I will turn off Lyft or basically, you know, say, or, or sign off Lyft, I guess is a better way to word that. Drive that ride for Uber. The second I'm done, I'll pull Lyft back up, sign back on. And what I'll do is I'll go back and forth and bounce between the apps to see which one is paying more, especially in that instance. Maybe I get a ride through Lyft that looks like a really great ride. I'll go with that one. And then I'll turn off or sign out of Uber. This is a great way to make a lot of money. And I know it sounds a bit hectic and chaotic kind of bouncing between both apps. One important note though, I have to say about the app bounce is bonuses. If let's you're trying to get a specific bonus, whether it's that weekend or that week, whatever the case is, a lot of times both apps will have a certain clause that's an acceptance rate. Meaning, I'm making this up, you have to have 90% acceptance rates. So if you keep rejecting a bunch of rides, they will actually penalize you. And the last thing, and this happens more than you think surprisingly, the last thing you want to have happen, like you're trying to get a bonus through Uber, you have both Uber and Lyft pulled up, a Lyft ride pops up, you accept it. The second you accept that Lyft ride and you go to Uber to like say sign out, you get a ride through Uber. Now you cancel that ride and because you canceled it, it's affecting your acceptance rate. Keep that in mind. Like say if you are trying to get a specific bonus, just be constant of the acceptance rate overall because I find especially when I'm doing the app bounce and I'm running both apps at the exact same time, as you can imagine, I'm just trying to get the best ride possible. So a Lyft ride will pop up and I'm like, eh, I don't know, close it out or, or deny it. A Uber ride will pop up, eh, okay, that one's not bad, except sign out of Lyft, then I go and drive for uh, for Uber, I finish off the ride, pull Lyft back up, turn the app back on, etc., etc. I know this can be a bit chaotic and hectic, like I said, but this is a great way to make a lot of money and you don't have to necessarily go back and forth between both apps, you know, super aggressively, but maybe every so often, let's say, especially like I said on a Friday night, maybe after a couple hours of driving for Uber, just check on Lyft. See if there's any unique bonuses that maybe have popped up in that instant, or maybe see if there's any good surges or good surge pockets. If there's not, you close it down and continue driving for Uber. Do it more than you think, because I think a lot of drivers, and this is what I used to be like, will drive for Uber for, I don't know, a month and never even touch Lyft, or maybe a couple weeks and never even touch Lyft. Honestly, check it as much as you can. Go back and forth and bounce between both apps as much as you can, because that's the best way to optimize your earnings. Just get an aux cord. This allows somebody, in case you don't know, to play their own music in your car when they're heading to their destination, especially on Friday and Saturday nights. If let's say people are going to a concert or an event, they want to be able to bump and hear their own music on the way there. And this allows you to have a way higher rating. And a lot of the times too, I find people tip more when they say, hey, I have an aux cord. Who wants to hook up to it? Play whatever you want. Let's bump some music as we get to our destination. Now, I'm gonna give you three huge pro tips when it comes to using an aux cord. And I will say, I have a link list below in the description if you wanna pick one up. They're super cheap, being honest. You can even get one at the dollar store if you want. But before I give you those pro tips, I am gonna talk about Bluetooth. Now you may be watching this saying, well, I have Bluetooth in my car. Why not just use that? In case you don't know, Bluetooth allows you to wirelessly connect from your car 
to anybody's phone, device, whatever they have. The main reason why I suggest to avoid this is one, sometimes it just doesn't work. Bluetooth can be super annoying. With an aux cord, you plug it right in, you are good to go. The second thing is the safety aspect. For most cars, I'm pretty sure all cars now, you cannot connect a new device until you are stopped. Meaning, let's say someone gets in your car, you start driving, someone says, hey, uh, can I play some music? And you're like, oh yeah, give me a second. You're gonna have to pull over on the side, find a spot to pull over, pull over safely, like say throw on your hazards or whatever. And you have to do that thing where like, okay, well, it's pairing now. Are you pairing? Is it pairing yet? And then they have to enter in a code and you have to connect and everything. And sometimes, and this has happened to me before, I'm in an Uber or Lyft and for whatever reason, the phone just doesn't connect for, I don't know, I have no idea why, right? And now you're like, great, we pulled over, wasted five minutes trying to connect. It didn't work. Now we're just gonna have to get back out on the road. Although there are advantages to Bluetooth, I just suggest using an aux cord, it's a lot easier. Now here are three huge pro tips when using an aux cord. The first is a base adjust. I already did a video about this in this Uber driver tips and Lyft driver tips series. A big thing is in the morning, this is what I used to do, especially with my Prius, which had a great sound system. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but my Prius would bump. In the morning, I just have all the levels on the EQ be normal. At the nighttime though, especially on Friday and Saturday nights, I go to the EQ settings, go to my base and turn it up. And that way when someone would get in the car and I'd hand them the aux cord, if they played like hip hop or EDM or whatever, once that bass would hit, it would be bumping. And numerous times, I'm not exaggerating, I will be in the car, they start playing a song and that bass kicks in and they're like, whoa, dude, your Prius is bumping. And I'm like, yeah, these Priuses have great sound systems. And already that kind of like, whoa, reaction is great for a fun ride. It's great for, again, ratings, tips, everything. So turn up the bass, as cliche as it is to say, turn up that bass on Friday, Saturday nights, or any events. The second thing, make sure cable is long enough. If you drive a normal sedan, you should be okay. But if let's say you have like a huge van, it's not a bad idea to get a really, really long cable just in case someone's in the back and they don't have to do like this thing, like trying to, you know, lean forward and like type on their phone or whatever. It just makes it a lot easier. The third thing, and this is just an unfortunate one, get the iPhone hookup. In case you don't know, in case you don't have an iPhone, iPhones do not have the headphone jack. Meaning in order to play on an aux cord with an iPhone, you need a special hookup that connects the aux cord to the lightning port in the iPhone. I have a link list below in the description if you wanna pick one up. I suggest having it as most people have iPhones and if you do hold up that aux cord, and I promise you, if you hold up that aux cord saying, hey, I have an aux cord, play whatever you want, I guarantee you someone will say, uh, I wish, but I can't plug it into my phone. I have an iPhone. And that's where you come in and say, hey, I actually have the extension. I have the hookup. Play whatever you want. Especially on Friday, Saturday nights, have them even tip you more and have a way better interaction. So when you are driving and like say you can go to your dashboard about your audio, you can adjust in case you know the treble, the bass, the mid, all those aspects of EQing. I'm not gonna get too much into music production, but in very simple terms, you can turn up the bass or turn it down. Now when I'm driving, like say in morning and evening commutes, I pretty much have the bass at like a pretty neutral level. I have whatever's playing on the radio or maybe I do like top 40 on Pandora. However, once it gets to the nighttime, once it's like a Friday or Saturday night, I purposely will go to my settings on my console and turn up the bass. That way, when I'm bringing people to the club or the bar or wherever they're pre-gaming at or whatever the case is, and that bass is super bumping in the car, you'd be surprised how much people love that. And that's a big thing to remember, especially, you know, make sure you have an aux cord. I want to say that as a quick side note, but especially, like say if someone wants to play their own music, and for me, I love EDM. In case you didn't know, I'm also a DJ electronic music producer. I have a link list below in the description to my music. The good thing is if someone throws on electronic music or hip hop and that bass is booming and it's loud, people usually get super excited. I even remember when I used to have a Prius, no joke, Priuses can bump, I want to say that, and I would turn up the bass in my Prius and people play their music or I'd be playing music and people were like, wow, 
your Prius has a ridiculous system. I'm like, yeah, Priuses have JBL speakers. The bass in here is insanely good. Didn't even know that a Prius could actually pump or have really good bass. And remember that for a lot of people going out, they're going to party, maybe they've already been drinking or whatever. They want to hear good bass and they obviously want to hear that bass pumping in the car and that's going to give them a way better ride. This one is a bit taboo and that is having bathroom addresses. Now again, I know this is a bit taboo, but when you're driving in for 90% of drivers out there, you're driving in a city, going to the bathroom, especially if you're driving full time, is a lot harder than most people think. I mean, well, I feel like most people kind of can kind of assume, yeah, if you're driving the city, you're driving for hours, you need to go to the bathroom, you know, because you're staying hydrated. It's not the easiest thing in a city. So what I always do is when I'm driving, let's say I drive by a Starbucks or a grocery store, basically somewhere that has a very um, accessible place in terms of parking, where it's very easy to park at, where I can easily pop in, pop back out. I'll actually pull up the notes app on my phone and type in that bathroom address. That way, let's say if I'm driving, I'm like, shoot, I really gotta go. I pull up my notes, I see all the addresses right there. I pick the one that's closest to me and then boom, I head to that spot. Now, another pro tip on top of this, I also put in the lock code. So for a lot of places like Starbucks and other ones, they will actually have a certain code, like a bathroom code where it's usually like a five or six digit number. So what I'll do is when I go to that Starbucks, as opposed to walking up kind of awkwardly and saying, hey, we'll see the code for the bathroom. And then I go in, I will put on that notes app, not only the address, of the location, but the bathroom lock code as well. That way, if I really need to go, again, I hit that, you know, on Notes app, hit that address as closest to me. If there's a lock code, boom, I have it saved right in my Notes app and I'm good to go. I really wish I knew way earlier on because one unique thing about Lyft and Uber that's kind of, like everyone knows this, but it's kind of very underrated is the fact that you're having numerous conversations with random people. It's not forced. It's not awkward, really, because you're used to the idea of, you know, someone gets in your car, the passenger is used to having a conversation with the driver, and vice versa. And this is a big one for any driver that has an entrepreneurial pursuit. Let's say you're trying to become an actor. Let's say you want to do YouTube. You know, for me, obviously, when I was driving for Lyft and Uber, I was hustling on music a lot. And one big thing is to have business cards on you. And I know this doesn't, in some ways, this doesn't directly relate to Lyft and Uber, but in some ways it does. And the reason why is you'd be surprised, especially let's say if you're a beginner driver, you haven't done that many rides, you can be surprised. The number one question I find overall when it comes to being a driver is people will say, oh, so you drive for Lyft and Uber. What else do you do? Is this your main job? And overall people are asking you if you're doing anything else besides driving. And so many times I would get this question, especially, you know, when I first started driving and it was unexpected. I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm actually a musician. I drive for Lyft and Uber to help pay for my music career and everything. And people, I'd say almost about 75% of the time would be like, oh really? Well, what's your name? What's your channel? What's your Spotify? And the name I produce music under is actually my last name, which is Fechero, F-R-E-C-C-E-R-O. Not the easiest name to spell. So I'd say that and people would be like, oh, okay, cool. And I could tell they're just making small talk or they're just like, oh yeah, I'm never gonna search this guy. However, after I got business cards, I remember any single time someone asked me for my music, I'd pull out the business card, hand it to them and be like, hey, you know what? I mean, since you asked, you know, cause they did, here's my card, my SoundCloud's on there, my Spotify, my channels are on there, et cetera, et cetera. This is a great way, in my opinion, to really grow your business or any other side hobbies that you have because there is something, even though it's maybe considered old school in a sense, there is something super unique about a business card, I feel like, that one, it's tangible, like it's a physical thing. So let's say when someone gets back to their house and they take all this stuff out of their pockets, their wallet, their keys, their phone, whatever, they have that physical business card. Even if, let's say, someone searches me on Spotify and finds me or... Um, I type it into their notes app or they do or whatever. It's still something digital that they could easily forget about. However, with a business card, like I said, that physical aspect to it, I think is such a great marketing tool. And again, this is something that I know does not directly relate to making more money driving for Lyft and Uber, but if you do have a side hobby and a side pursuit, it is such an underrated aspect of Lyft and Uber that it's actually a kind of a cool marketing tool. It's a cool way to kind of get your name out there. You have a great one-on-one -on -one conversations 
And like I said, because most people ask you like, hey, what do you do besides Lyft and Uber? This is a great way to get your name out there depending on what you're doing, whatever you're doing. I mean, hey, it's a client business and by getting your name out there more, it's growing any pursuit that you have. Caffeine pills. I've used these a bunch of times. These are magic. And the main reason why is if you're doing one of those crazy marathon sessions where you're driving for four, eight, even 12 hours straight, as you can imagine, having more energy and being on top of your game is a lot better than being super tired and groggy. However, I've tried a bunch of other just supplements and whatnot in terms of energy drinks, even some pre-workouts, obviously a bunch of coffee. And the issue is that, well, yes, they do hype you up and get you energized. You have to, you have to constantly stop and have to go to the bathroom. And especially, let's say if it's a Friday or Saturday night, one, it can be super tough, especially in the city. And two, that time you're taking out to go to the bathroom, maybe drive to a different area to stop somewhere or whatever, is taking time away from driving, especially during these surge hours. So one amazing things about caffeine pills is one, it's just a small pill you take, so it's super easy, it's super convenient and portable. You don't have to stop and go to the bathroom every five seconds. And of course, it gives you energy. Now, one big thing I have to stress is make sure you're safe with these. I do have a link listed below to my favorite caffeine pills I've taken. Also, there's a bunch of them out there. But for most caffeine pills, 90% of them, one pill has 200 milligrams of caffeine. In case you don't know, that's roughly equal to two to three cups of coffee. So it's pretty intense. Like for me, I'm not ultra sensitive to caffeine, but I'm not immune to caffeine, right? Like I know some people can have tons of coffee and be fine. I'm kind of like in the middle. So for me, I know even just one caffeine pill can sometimes be a little bit too much. So I suggest maybe start even with like a half a pill, like break it in half just to see how you feel. Another option is Neuromints. I love these. Uh, these not only freshen your breath because they're mints and obviously that's kind of the point of mints, but one of these, I might as well show you, is only, is only 40 milligrams of caffeine. Two of them is 80. So two of these equal one cup of coffee. So I'm more likely to have Neuromints because also too, especially with the pills, you do kind of need some water, right, to swallow them down. They're not chewables for most caffeine pills. So with these, they're mints. So like I said, they freshen your breath. In addition, um, you can chew them. You don't need to have water gonna, to kind of put them down. And lastly, they're a lot weaker than caffeine pills because sometimes caffeine pills can be very intense, way more intense than you think. I uh, link this below to Normans if you want to check them out or other caffeine pills. But you can get these pretty much anywhere, right? Anywhere on Amazon, anywhere at CVS, other convenience stores. The biggest thing I suggest though is just be careful with caffeine pills especially if you are sensitive to caffeine. However though, especially when you're doing those marathon rides and drives, like I said, where you're gonna be driving all over the place, especially on a Friday and Saturday night, caffeine pills are amazing to make it super quick and convenient to have energy without having to stop and go to the bathroom every five seconds. This is a great pro tip that builds upon a couple other pro tips. First off, make sure you sign up with both apps. The second thing is remember, like I've said in numerous videos, it's all about the analytics. Each area is a bit different in terms of the optimal times you can drive. So one huge pro tip is look, but don't touch. What I'm talking about is in both the Lyft app and the Uber app, there is an analytics section showing you the best times to drive of that day, of the week. They show you sport events that are going on and this is invaluable information. And as simple and obvious as this is to say, remember, you can always check the analytics in a given app and not drive for them and then drive for your preferred app. For example, I have personally found just over the years that Uber pays more than Lyft. I've noticed this in my own personal experience. In addition, when I travel a lot and talk to a lot of drivers, I have noticed that more of them prefer Uber over Lyft in terms of the overall pay. However, for me personally, I actually like the analytics layout and the quote unquote best times to drive feature on the left app, but that doesn't mean I have to drive for them. So for example, let's say you're getting ready for the week. It's a Sunday or a Monday and you're like, all right, I'm going to see when the best time to drive is this week. Let's check out any concerts, any, you know, gaming events going on, whatever the case is, pull up the left app, 
look at the Lyft app in terms of the analytics, then go and drive for Uber. Or let's say for you, if it's the other way around, go to the Uber app, look at all the analytics of the best times to drive, any events going on, et cetera, et cetera, and then drive for Lyft. Even though this pro tip is super simple, it can allow you to make a lot of money because remember, both Lyft and Uber spend insane amounts of money going into their analytics, trying to show you the best times to drive. Because if you drive more and make more money, they make more money. So use those features even if you don't drive for that app. As simple as it is, get a car wash. The reason why is, as you can imagine, especially in places where it doesn't snow or rain, like here in LA, it barely ever rains, your car can get dirty. And as you pull up to pick somebody up, the first impression they're gonna get of you in terms of the rating, you as a driver, how much they potentially even wanna tip you, is the outside of your vehicle. And as we all know, first impressions go a long way. So try to get a car wash as much as you can. You don't have to overdo it, but maybe at least once every two weeks, probably a bit less than that. But just make sure that when you pull up, the outside of your car looks amazing. Because let's say the outside of it's super dirty, but the inside is super clean, super nice and everything. They still have that first impression as you pull up, as they make sure it's the right car, they make the model, the license plate and everything. They're gonna be like, oh wow, this car is super dirty on the outside and that's already starting off the ride interaction on a negative light. Getting car washes can go a long way, just do it. Having a credit card. Now I wanna say right in the beginning of this video, I'm a former accountant, but I'm not your accountant. Everybody's situation is different, but overall, as we all know, when it comes to driving, there's a lot of expenses that you're gonna have. Gas is the most common one. You're gonna have to do more maintenance on your car. If you wanna actually buy goodies or snacks for your car in terms of maybe you have to buy, I don't know, like an ox cord, you have to buy all this different stuff. Another big one, and this is I think one that a lot of people overlook, is also tolls. I mean, if you think about it, especially, maybe not here in California, but in Boston, I remember that every single time I'd go through a toll, I'd get reimbursed for it. So let's say, especially let's say the airport toll is crazy. Let's say if I had, I don't know, let's say $40 in tolls for one week, Lyft and Uber would always reimburse me for that $40. So if you think about it, you spend 40 bucks, you get 40 bucks back. If you have a credit card, you can get points, goodies and whatnot. And essentially it's like getting those for free because yeah, you're spending that $40, but then you're gonna get paid it back through Lyft and Uber. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot to credit cards, whether you get a cash back credit card, whether it's for like say traveling where you get miles back or offers or goods or services, whatever the case is, having a credit card is an amazing way to build your credit. It shows people you can effectively manage debt and pay off that debt. And especially in the future, if you're looking to buy a car, like say you're just renting through Lyft and Uber, like say you want to get a house, pretty much any single time you wanna get a loan on anything, if you show a really high credit score, that is gonna be huge to set you up for the future opportunities in life. Now, one thing I wanna say, and I have to stress on this video as well, remember, the way credit card companies primarily make their money is from charging you interest. So, if you're somebody that, let's say, gets a credit card, and then says, hey, you can spend maximum $5,000, and you see that, and you're like, oh, wow, I can spend five grand right now, and you blow through it, of course, don't get a credit card, right? So I wanna stress that point that you don't wanna get a credit card if you know you're gonna be bad with it. If you know just, you know, deep downside, you're not gonna be the, the most responsible person with a credit card, of course don't get one. But for most people driving for an Uber, like I said, especially because you're gonna be having so many expenses almost daily. I mean, especially if you drive a lot, there's a lot of expenses that pop up. Why not get a credit card? So any single time you spend money, any single time you pay with that credit card, you're getting pretty much free points, free discounts, free miles, whatever it is on top of you driving. My brother actually gave me this pro tip. He's driving for Lyft in Denver, Colorado. So I was talking to him about it and he told me this amazing pro tip when it comes to using destination filters. Now for most drivers, you use a destination filter typically when going home. In case you don't know, when you set a destination filter, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I wanna make sure that my ride gets dropped off around this specific area. So like I said, a lot of drivers do this at the end of their shift because it makes sense. You get dropped off somewhere close to your home. That way you have an easier time getting home and you're almost you know, on the way as opposed to picking somebody up and dropping them off super far away from you. What my brother will do is a bit different though. 
Take, let's say, a peak hour surge in the morning commuting hours, for example. What he'll do is set the destination filter to the radius where he thinks it's going to be the biggest surge pocket for that moment. That way, when he drops somebody off in that area, he's already in that surge pocket and he knows he can make a lot more money that way. Another thing that's super useful when it comes to this, specifically for Denver, and this is why he does it, is the airport, in case you didn't know in Denver, is very far from the city. So compared to other cities where, like, say, if you get an airport ride, you're like, oh, it's going to be a good amount of money. And Denver, it's the opposite. It brings you all the way out and you're like, you know, in the middle of nowhere, basically. And you're just hoping you get an airport ride to come back in. But airport rides are not the best in Denver. So we'll make sure that, let's say, in a morning commuting hour, so it doesn't get dragged out to the airport, he'll use that destination filter to specifically pick a surge pocket, one, to make more money by being in, like, the main hotspot, but two, to avoid going all the way out to the airport. Of course, every city is different, but this is a great pro tip to use as opposed to using the destination filter for your home at the end of the day, use it for a high surge pocket to make more money. And this pro tip, it's more useful, I find on Friday and Saturday nights, anytime there's alcohol involved. So maybe it's St. Patrick's Day during the day. The reason why in these cases, you should actually not say the name and almost complete opposite is because, and we've probably all seen this with friends or when driving, people can get in the wrong Ubers or Lyfts pretty consistently. Let's say the car, if the cars look similar, let's say they've been, they've been drinking way too much, whatever the case is, there's so many times where someone gets in a Lyft or Uber, the driver says, hey, Tom? And they're like, yeah, I'm Tom, I'm Tom, let's go, let's go. And their friends are like, whoa, Tom, that's the wrong Uber. Get out, get out. Our Uber's not here yet. So my best pro tip, is when someone, let's say, gets in your car, not saying your name. Say, hey, who are you here to see? What's the driver's name? Maybe ask them for your own name. Or say, hey, what is your name? Those are two huge ways to go about it. Because like I said, they're like, uh, um, I'm here to, my, my driver is Mike. And I'm like, nope, I'm actually Mark. You're in the wrong Uber. Or if let's say, I'm like, hey, uh, excuse me, just to make sure you're in the right Uber, what's your name? And they're like, oh, I'm Tom but I'm here to pick up Kyle. Well, turns out they're getting in the wrong Uber as well. This is a huge one, just confirm with them because if you say, oh, are you blank? A lot of drunk people are just like, yeah, yeah, I'm them, let's go, let's go. Obviously they're just kind of saying that and going along with it because they're drunk. So make sure, especially like I said, when people's judgments are impaired, or let's say if you like say want to be as safe as possible, you could even just any single time someone gets in your car, say, hey, what driver are you here for? What's the driver's name? Can you confirm what my name is? In addition, what's your name? Make sure that you're confirming you're picking up the right person and you're not saying your name straight out by saying, hey, Jessica, Tom, once you get the confirmation that you're picking up the right person, then you're good to go. One of my favorite tips to really maximize how much money you can make, especially in the amazing surge pockets. This trick works the best on Friday and Saturday nights when you're dropping off somebody at a nightclub, a bar, whatever the case is, the early drop off. Here's what you do. When you're driving in a city, we all know this, these certain places or certain roads, especially where when you approach them, the traffic is ridiculous. I like to call it the drop off traffic. Cause if you think about it, there's a bunch of cars, like say it's a crazy one-way street, like the big one for me when I was driving in Boston was Lansdowne street. You get on that street and every car moves like an inch a minute. And the worst part is, and this is what always happens, you get into that street, you're stuck in traffic for a couple minutes, and what does everyone do? They say, hey, you know what, driver? We'll just get out now. You can end the ride, we'll just get out now. Everyone gets out and you're like, great. The ride just ended. Now I'm stuck waiting on this one way, or even two ways sometimes, doesn't matter, and I have to wait 20 minutes during a high surge hour, you're just wasting time and not moving. So what I do, is what I like to call the early drop off. So what you do is as you're approaching it, this is what I do is I say, hey guys, I'm not gonna lie, it's actually faster for you if I drop you off on this corner, that way you don't have to wait longer in this traffic and the line for the bar is gonna get way longer. If I drop you off here right at the corner, you're gonna be faster on foot and that way you can get into the bar sooner. And it's a win-win because most people are like, you know what, we appreciate that. If we do wait in that crazy long street of traffic, it's gonna take longer to get into the bar because the line is gonna get longer. And also for you, it's a win because that way you drop them off, they get into the bar sooner. And for you, you don't have to wait into that traffic and you can continue driving during those surge periods. It's a win-win, a win for your passengers 
and a win for you. Now, yes, I will say there are a couple exceptions to this. For example, if let's say it's bad weather, a lot of passengers are like, eh, you know what? Um, we'll just wait. If you could just drop us off at front. I know there's some traffic, but it's raining. Which I understand. That completely makes sense. Or like say on the other end, like say it's a group of girls. They're wearing some super high heels. They might be like, hey, you know what? Walking's extremely difficult for us, even if it's only a little bit, which I understand. I get it. So they're like, hey, you know what? Do you mind just dropping us off at the front of the nightclub or the venue? No issue there. However, though, I will say that in about 90% of situations, most people are going to be happy that you suggest to them to do the early drop off because they know walking on foot is going to be significantly faster than waiting in that crazy long line of cars. And you can continue driving during those high surge hours. On this pro tip, I want to talk about eco mode. This is a big one, especially right now, at least at the exact time of this video, gas prices are obnoxious. That's probably an understatement. And eco mode is a great mode that a lot of cars, especially in recent years, almost every single car has this. And what you do is you hit a button, it might be on your dashboard, it might be on the settings of your car, let's say on the main screen. You know, every car has a different version of where it's located. Eco mode puts your car into a special mode, and as it sounds, you use less power, but also you use less gas. So overall, one, it's way better for the environment in general, but two, and probably the bigger thing for most drivers out there, since you're using less gas, it's way cheaper for you Overall, I remember when I was driving with my Prius, I tested it out. I had three different modes on the Prius. There was normal mode, so just normal driving, eco mode, and power mode, which is funny to say that a Prius had power mode. But power mode, as you can imagine, took up way more gas than you can imagine. It was a very significant difference. But then when I put on eco mode, it was ridiculous how much more gas I would save, even compared to the normal mode on a Prius. As we all know, Priuses are great on gas, but eco mode was significantly better than that. The only time I noticed that my car is on eco mode, because most of the time I'm really never notice it, is if let's say I hit a really, really steep hill, I noticed I would get up the hill a bit slower than if let's say it was on power mode. But besides that, you're never really even gonna notice your car is on eco mode. I mean, especially when it comes to those hills, like I mentioned, you might get up it in four seconds, as opposed to if you were on power mode or normal mode, in 3.5 seconds, right? So it's not that big of a difference. It's a great feature. I highly suggest doing research on your own vehicle. Of course, every vehicle is different, like I said. Make sure your car is on eco mode. It's great for the environment, and of course, saves you money. Now, when it comes to driving, we all know the best time to drive is during the peak hours, which are typically morning and evening commutes, Friday and Saturday nights. Those are the best times because obviously the surge rates are higher, more people are ordering lifts and ordering Ubers, therefore more money in your pocket. However, one big aspect when it comes to driving for Lyft and Uber is looking at events. For example, let's say it is a Tuesday and it's 1 p.m. That's my kind of cliche time frame I usually give for a bad time to drive. Because let's be honest, Tuesday, 1 p.m., nothing going on. You're probably better off not driving. However, if there's a big event going on, you can make an insane amount of money. For example, I remember when I was driving in Boston, there would be times, especially during graduation time, I remember there was one day, it was a Tuesday and Wednesday, it was a two day long graduation ceremony, both BC and BU, two colleges there, were having it. The surge rates during that time were higher than they were on Friday and Saturday nights. Tons of people needed to take a look from Uber to get to the graduation ceremony, and guess what? That equaled more money in my pocket. If let's say it's a Wednesday night in your area, there might not be that much stuff going on. However, if there's a big baseball game, a big sporting game, if there's a massive concert, Lyft and Uber fees and the surge rates are gonna be so high, that equals way more money. I mean, look what happens on New Year's Eve. Any single time there's an event or any activity where there's a lot of people needing a Lyft and Uber, that equals more money in your pocket. So my biggest suggestion for you as the drivers in terms of finding the events, Google in your area, look at concerts, or maybe even sign up, there's a bunch of like, you know, newsletters you can get online through emails that say, hey, here's a bunch of events going on in your area. Look at those because yeah, maybe a Wednesday night, not the biggest time to drive, but let's say there's a massive concert, a massive sporting event, a graduation, or basically any thing or any event that's having a lot of people, you're gonna bet that you make an insane amount of money. And even more so, those surge rates can sometimes typically be the same as a Friday and Saturday night or even more. Welcome back to my series, Uber Driver Tips and Lyft Driver Tips, where I give you Uber tips and Lyft tips to help you make more money 
get higher ratings, and overall have a way better time driving for Lyft and driving for Uber. This is going to be a super quick one. Some of these pro tips, and I like to make these videos short anyway, but some of these are more long, some more short. This one, just have for Breeze. Pretty straightforward, pretty direct. You know, there are very few things I suggest to have in your car, and I've talked about them, like paper towels isn't a bad idea. Of course, a phone mount, an aux cord, uh, a phone charger, of course. These are kind of like basic items, but the only item that I really suggest that you might not think about, or one of the few items that I suggest that you might not think about is for Breeze. The main reason why, as you can imagine, is smell, or maybe not too surprising, is a big factor. Because if you think about it, the initial impression of you, of you as a rideshare, how much money you're gonna get as a tip, your rating, is of course the outside of your vehicle. That's the first impression. Then when someone opens it, they get two different impressions right away. One, how dirty or clean is the inside of your car and to the smell and i feel like for most people i'd much rather sit in a car that's a bit dirty but smells nice than vice versa and let's say even if it doesn't smell bad but just odd like let's say someone gets in your car and someone before had mcdonald's or something else and you're sitting there in the car and all you can smell is that incredible mcdonald's fries smell say what you want i love mcdonald's fries say what you want but they're amazing but let's say, you know, you get in the car, that might be the last thing you want to smell is that intense McDonald's smell or any other smell that's not pleasant. I like Febreze personally, and I'm going to stress, I have no affiliation with them. That'd be funny if I was sponsored by them. But what I like about it when I have used Febreze is as opposed to the combination of the smells, like if I have like another spray that's like, let's say cinnamon or apple cinnamon, I feel like it's like mcdonald's fries and apple cinnamon at the same time and it's almost like worse i feel like you know like having two conflicting smells as opposed to for breeze i feel like when i have for breeze it more tries to mask the smell and makes the car smell fresh of course i roll down my windows and everything but i feel like having for breeze is just a good backup option you can even get like a small bottle have it there you may not have to use it that much but it's there if you need it this is a huge pro tip that it's it should be a staple when it comes to driving, and that is finish off strong. What I mean is psychologically, bringing in some psychology now, the biggest things that people remember are one, a first impression, of course, we all know that, but also the last impression. And I've gotten a lot of comments and questions of people saying, hey Mark, you know, how do I get a five-star rating if me and the passenger aren't talking? Most people now just get in the car, go right on their phone, that's pretty much it. And the best way to do this is finish off strong. So let's say you pull up to the person's place before they get out of the car, say a nice positive affirmation, basically something to finish off the ride in a very positive light. So you could say, hey, you know, uh, thank you so much for riding with me. It really means a lot. Have a good day. Have a good night. And let's say if you have some small talk with the person and they tell you they're trying to be an actor, let's say here in LA, you could see something along the lines of, hey, have a great day, and by the way, good luck with acting, hope to see you on Netflix soon, or something like that. So even though you didn't have a lot of conversation during the ride, by finishing off strong, by finishing off on a really positive and on a good point, when the person gets out of the car, if you think about it, that's the last thing they're gonna remember when it comes to the ride. And by using this technique, whether you reference something that they said earlier in the conversation, even if it was a quick one, or if you just give a generic, good luck with everything, have a good night, have a good day, this helps ensure that you get a five-star rating, hopefully, every single time. Hopefully, you never have to use, but if you do, make sure you do it ASAP, and that is first contact. What I'm talking about is because you are in the customer service industry, and as we all know, customer service can be very interesting when you deal with a lot of people, it's almost inevitable if you're gonna be driving that even if you do nothing wrong, somehow something could happen that's gonna be your fault. There's a lot of drivers who unfortunately get deactivated for no reason. And let's be honest, usually Uber and Lyft will side more with the rider for whatever reason than the driver. This is why I always suggest, if you have any incident, any situation when you're driving, whether it's a minor one or a major one, contact Lyft and Uber immediately. I don't know what it is, but it comes this becomes this kind of thing where because you have the first contact, you said, hey, look, uh, this and this happened with this passenger. You know, I don't know what happened. This is what happened with me. I wasn't doing anything wrong. 
If you look at my past ratings, I've gotten five stars for all my ratings. This is the first negative interaction I've had with a rider. I just want to let you know right away, this is what happened. Just want to give you the heads up. I think it's a lot better to be proactive and say to Lyft and Uber, this is the situation that just occurred, than be retroactive, have them contact you saying, hey, uh, we just heard back from this passenger that you did X, Y, and Z, or X, Y, and Z happened, what's going on? And now you're on the back foot being like, oh, well, no, no, like, like th this is actually what happened, like, blah, 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 said this, and then this, and then yada, yada, yada. That's the last position you want to be in. And of course, you never know what's going to happen. You know, most riders that you're going to have are awesome, being honest, but it's inevitable sometimes, you know, especially if you drive a lot, you will have people that no matter what, it is your fault. And in these situations, it's always important to have the first contact with Lyft and Uber in case any altercation happens. This is a comment I got from Focus Zones. Want to give them a shout out. And they said, hey, Mark, one great pro tip or one great tip I have when it comes to driving for Uber and Lyft is getting the Flush app. On this app, you pull it up and it shows you all the public restrooms in your area. And I've mentioned before the pro tip of having bathroom addresses that when you're driving, going to the bathroom is something you do have to worry about. I do suggest having a list of bathrooms, I know it sounds weird, on your notes app. That way you know the best ones to go to when driving around. However, though, if you just started driving or you don't know the area or let's say you're in a place that you're like, I don't know even where to go, but I got to go. Pull up the Flush app. It's a great app to have, not only when driving, but just in general. I mean, hey, I'm here in Austin, Texas for the month. I'm gonna use it when going out, especially when bouncing around and if I need to go, I pull up the app, look for the restrooms in my area, and I'm good to go. Very useful if you are a part-time driver, but even more useful if you are a full-time driver, and that is get a gas credit card. Now, I already did a video about credit cards, how it's a great pro tip, because hey, when you're driving, you have a lot of expenses, gas of course, is a big expense. Maintenance on your car, um, things that, you, that you're gonna buy when driving, et cetera, et cetera. And having a credit card is a great way to get a lot of points, perks, miles, and a lot more. And it helps build your credit score, which is great if you wanna get a car in the future. If you want to, I don't know, buy something that has a lot of expenses behind it in terms of like say getting a big loan or something that's very expensive, whatever the case is. And I suggest a gas credit card because if you think about it, gas, especially if you're driving full time, is by far the biggest expense you're gonna have. You have to get gas a lot. And with a gas credit card, a lot of them have a lot of great perks that are specifically related to gas. So they might say, hey, you know, with this gas credit card, if you buy gas here, you're gonna get, I don't know, five or 10 cents off every gallon. That adds up a lot, especially if you're driving full time, that can save you a lot of money and you also get all the perks of that credit card. Two things I do have to say. One, and I said this before in that other video about credit cards, if you're not good with money, don't get one. If you, let's say, get that credit card and you're like, wow, $5,000 credit limit and you go and blow it, not the best thing, of course. Remember, credit card companies make their money by you spending money, not being able to pay it off, and then you get charged interest. The second thing is remember, I know this sounds kind of stupid to say, but just keep this in mind. Remember that credit card is meant for that one specific gas station. So let's say you get one for Shell, for example, and you're driving around, you're bouncing around, you're doing a bunch of rides, and you have to stop at a mobile gas station. You could still use that credit card at mobile. You still get some of the perks, you know, depending on the terms, but you might not get a discount on that gas, for example. Keep that in mind. However, remember, even if you stop at other gas stations in your area, they're not related. You still get some of the perks because you're spending money, you're paying it off, building your credit, et cetera, et cetera. A gas credit card is just a great thing to have because if you're looking to get a credit card, like I said, you're probably gonna be buying gas the most by far. Why not save some money on it and get a lot of perks while doing so? On this huge pro tip, I wanna talk about the general GPS error. This is a big one that you're probably going to encounter a lot when driving, especially in any big city where there's a lot of big landmarks and a lot of big general locations. Be more specific. I'm talking about a mall, a college campus, those type of locations. The reason why is a lot of times when people are getting picked up or going to those locations, they will just type it in. 
So when I first, like say, started driving in Boston, someone say, hey, Mark, I want to go to Harvard, right? To go to Harvard, to go to the school. But are they going to a dorm? Are they going to a specific lecture hall? Are they going to a restaurant on the campus, et cetera, et cetera? And when I would get the ride, and let's say they get in my car, I'd be like, hey, I know you said Harvard, but the pin drop on the GPS is in the entire general location of Harvard. Do you want to go to a more specific location? And then they'd be like, oh yeah, actually I want to go here or go there. Now the GPS on Lyft and Uber has increased a lot. It's gotten a lot better, but this also happens when picking people up. There's been some times, let's say at a mall, for example, if I go to pick somebody up, well, the, the pin drop or the point where I pick them up is the mall. Now they could be on one entrance, they could be on the other. So a big pro tip is if let's say you're driving, whether you're picking somebody up or dropping them off, if you see that pin on the GPS or that general location seem to be too centralized at that given area, always call them and say, hey, I know you're at this mall. I know you're at this campus. I know that you're at this park. The pin seems to be at a random location or the whole thing. Do you have any places you want me to pick you up at? Is there any address you have or address close to you that's more specific? This allows you to pick somebody up and drop them off way easier. This is a great way to make a lot more money, depends on the area, and that is to focus on hotspots. Hotspots are any area in your city or in your town, wherever you are, that you know there's gonna be a significant amount of traffic and the rides are gonna be higher. I find overall, these are usually based around traveling areas. So in Boston, around the airport or around South Station are huge hotspots. So my biggest technique is like say when I'm driving and I do this a lot, like when I was in Boston, for example, I would go to South Station. The reason why is I knew that going to South Station, most of the rides are going to be pretty long. They're probably going to be high surges because there's a lot of people who just came in, whether it's on a train, a bus, whatever, and they're trying to get to their next destination. So those rides are going to be longer. And I found I was better off picking somebody up, driving them to their location, turning the app off, or basically just signing off, getting closer, or getting back to that hotspot, again, South Station or the airport or whatever, and then waiting to turn the app back on until I was in that location. I made significantly more money. And even though, yeah, I might have to eat that time driving all the way back, I still made way more money overall. Now, two kind of sub pro tips I'll give upon this pro tip. One, make sure you check out the legal aspects of this. The reason why I say that, and this change, I think, but back in the day, speaking of South Station, they actually released something. I remember getting a email from Lyft saying, hey, just letting you know, uh, for all the drivers out there, they're cracking down. If you're sitting on idle, run right in front of South Station, you can possibly get a ticket even if you're driving, even if you're signing sign in on the app, even if you say you're a Lyft driver, you can potentially get a ticket. Being honest, I'm pretty sure that has changed because people are used to Lyft and Ubers being everywhere now, but it's something just to be aware of and just to look into depending on your area. The second thing is make sure you have the Lyft and Uber logo or emblem on your car, whether it's a sticker, whether it's like say, something as one of those like light up things in the front, Whatever the case is, that way, like say if you're at the airport and some cop drives by and they're like, what is this random car doing on idle? If they see you're a Lyft and Uber driver, usually they'll give you a little bit more slack where they won't be super aggressive for you to move your car, but they might still say something, right? It's tough to say, depends on the, uh, the security person in general. But at least by having that, it says to everyone, hey, I'm Lyft and Uber driver. Even if I'm on idle, I'm not doing it aimlessly. I'm doing it because it's my job and I'm just looking to pick up the next person. Not just for Uber and Lyft, but life in general, as cheesy as that is to say, and that is Huel. Now, in case you don't know, I love Huel. I've been taking Huel for about five years now. Huel, in, uh, in very simple terms, is basically powdered food. You have this bag of powdered food. Look at it like protein powder, for example. You put two scoops in a blender cup, shake it up. Obviously, you need water, so add water. You drink it. And you just got a super healthy, pretty inexpensive meal right there that is super convenient to take. And when it comes to Uber and Lyft, I feel like this is super, super helpful because when driving, it's very easy to be driving for a while. You start getting hungry. You see those like 
that uh, the light up yellow M, and you're like, oh, you know what? I've been trying to watch my eating habits, but McDonald's is right there. I can go through the drive through it takes two seconds, and next thing you know, you're eating a ton of fast food. When I first started driving for Uber and Lyft, I did start off part-time, but it was so easy, especially just being in the city and driving around, to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm super hungry, I've been driving, I've been working my butt off. You know what, I'll just get some fast food. And I started eating a lot unhealthier. Fuel is super easy, I think especially for a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers, because if you think about it, all you really need is a blender cup, which is super easy to have, and water. So let's say if you're driving, you're doing those kind of marathon hours, as opposed to even going through the drive-thru, which probably takes longer than making Huel, you could be driving, maybe pull over, grab that Huel bag, pour some water into your blender cup, put a couple scoops in, shake it up, drink it. You just got a 400 calorie meal that has everything your body needs, and you can just continue driving, especially for the time and the convenience. I mean, one serving of Huel is only about two to three bucks. So it's super inexpensive. And the last thing, which is huge for driving is it does not need to be refrigerated and you don't need a microwave. It's a nutritionally complete meal. When it comes to driving for Lyft and Uber, I'm telling you, Huel is one of the best tools for any driver. Idling over driving. A lot of times when I talk to drivers, and I still don't know why drivers do this, you know, we'll talk about how they drive for Uber and Lyft and all this kind of stuff. And I'll say, yeah, so, you know, how long do you drive for? And they're like, well, you know, I'm going to drop you off. Then I'll probably drive around wait for another ride, and I'll just keep doing that over and over and over again. Now, I will say this, Uber and Lyft, I mean, this wasn't the case in the past, but Uber and Lyft now, in case you don't know, you can actually accept a ride before you finish your current ride. So you're almost overlapping. Back in the day, it was a very hard cutoff where you finish your ride, you wait for a new request. You get a ride, you do that ride, you stop, you wait for a new request. Now it's an overlapping method, which is a lot better. However, if let's say it's a very slow night, let's say this is not a lot of rides in general in your area you are way better off and of course always be safe you are way better off after let's say you drop somebody off pulling over somewhere and idling just waiting for a ride then driving around i mean at the end of the day it's just pure economics where let's say if you're driving around and i remember back in the day you know i first started driving in 2014 2015 i would talk to drivers who say oh yeah i would drive around for five minutes before i got another ride i'm like well that's five minutes of you adding more miles onto your car, wasting more gas, putting more depreciation on your car. You're just, you know, you're, you're blowing money at that point. You're way better off. And of course, like I said, be safe because in a city, this can get a lot trickier, but you're way better off pulling over somewhere, maybe finding a quick parking lot, pulling over somewhere and throwing on your hazards, sitting there and waiting five minutes because you're gonna waste way less gas and everything as opposed to driving around. This is super important. One huge pro tip or a, a sub pro tip on top of this or pro tip section is try to avoid being close to where you drop the person off. I find that's more of like a, a sketchy note because as you can imagine, if let's say you go to someone's personal residence, you drop them off, you're sitting right in front of their house doing this idling over driving pro tip and you're like, oh, the Uber driver's still just outside of my house. They've been out there for the past five minutes. This is weird. So I always suggest after you drop them off, drive up like a couple blocks, just be out of sight, out of mind, but stay on idle. If you've not gotten that overlap request yet from Uber or Lyft, just stay on idle. Don't be zooming around and driving around unless you're trying to hit a surge pocket, which is a bit different. But if you're just aimlessly driving, remember, all you're doing is wasting more money. Hey, you're gonna have to spend more on gas, which right now at the time this video is outrageous. You can be putting way more depreciation on your car and a lot more. Always choose idling over driving. My approach when it comes to morning versus evening interactions. This is really interesting. Now, as we all know, we're in the customer service industry, right? You're driving people around. And after a while, you can kind of gauge if someone wants to talk or not, right? Someone gets in the car, you say, hey, how are you? Some people go right to their phone. They say, oh yeah, I'm good. They go right to their phone. Other people zone out. Other people are super talkative. It really depends. And a lot of it is just the psychology of gauging the person, right? However, I noticed that in the morning versus the evening, I actually adjust my energy level to help match that overall vibe. And when it comes to gauging that person, the cliche question, which I feel like everyone says is, hey, how are you? And I noticed that in the morning versus the evening, even though it'd be the same exact question, which is, hey, how are you? 
I would actually purposely adjust my energy level to match the person and match the overall vibe accordingly. I remember when I first started driving, this is in the morning, I remember I had a guy get in the car and I said, hey, how are you? But super peppy, upbeat, you know, super like excited. And he goes, sir, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't mean to be rude. I just had a daughter. Right now, the last thing I feel like is going to work. I'm really not happy about it. You seem like a nice guy. Respectfully, I just wanna be left alone and be dropped off at my work. And I was like, hey, I get it. And after that interaction and a lot of other ones, I realized that although every time someone would get in the car, I'd say, hey, how are you? By adjusting the energy level, I feel like it made it a better customer experience. So in the morning, and I'm not being boring, but in the morning, I'd be like, hey, how are you? How's your day going so far? Almost monotone. If somebody's in a really good mood and they want to talk, great. But for most people, it's the morning. They just woke up, they're going to work, which they're not happy about. In the evening though, I would flip it. I'd be like, hey, how are you? You know, um, how's your afternoon? Do you have any plans for the night? And I found by being more upbeat in the evening, I had a way better customer interaction. However, if I said, hey, how are you? How's your afternoon so far? Do anything fun later today? People seemed a bit off-putting, right? So I think even if you're asking the same question, as we all know, sometimes it's not what you say, but how you say it, by adjusting your energy level from the morning to the evening rides, it can make it a way better customer experience overall. Get the Pandora app. I'm gonna stress, I have no affiliation with Pandora, and I know Spotify is now the most popular, one of the most popular streaming apps, like Apple Music and other ones. I just like Pandora because of one, the GUI, like the, the graphical user interface is super intuitive. And two, this is huge to quickly put on any genre and it does pretty much everything for you in the background. Let's say if I'm doing morning rides, I might just put on top 40, smooth jazz, relaxing music, something along those lines. And then let's say if it's now a Friday night, boom, I put on EDM. I even have my own Pandora station. I have a link list below to it if you want to check it out because I'm also an electronic musician. So I might throw that on or something along those lines. This is really good too because let's say someone gets in the car and I'm like, hey, what do you want to listen to? And they're like, ah, I like country. Boom, I put on today's country. If someone wants to listen to rock, hip hop, classical, anything, any genre that they want, I can quickly select that station and it'll just play it in the background. I don't have to touch it again. It's just super easy to do that. In addition, one huge pro tip is today's comedy. Now I wanna stress, I would suggest not playing this when people are in the car, because sometimes it can be very explicit. However, I'm a huge fan of stand-up comedy. So between rides, just to have something on in the background that I can listen to and laugh to, after I drop somebody off, I'll put on that comedy station. Again, just to have something fun to listen to. Then as I approach the new person's place, I then switch it to hip hop, EDM, classical, rock, top 40, you know, whatever the case is, and then kind of switch back and forth depending if someone's in my car or not. This is more of just a personal thing because I love stand-up comedy. And so between rides, it gives me something fun to kind of look forward to, so to speak. And especially on the Pandora app, it's super easy to quickly change between stations. For this one, I'm still surprised, I have to mention this in a lot of videos, uh, you know, especially because Lyft and Uber is now super common. There's so many drivers on the road. It's been around for years, and that is to have a phone mount. I just took a Lyft and Uber recently here in LA, and the guy was doing that cliche thing where you have your phone down here, and you're kind of doing like this motion, like that weird bobblehead thing. When you're trying to look at the GPS, you're maybe trying to switch the music up, whatever you're doing, just get a phone mount. I even got a phone mount before I even became a Lyft and Uber driver because everybody uses their phone GPS when they're driving. It's just overall way safer and way more convenient to have a phone mount. I have a link this below in the description to the phone mount that I personally use. I have no affiliation with that company. I just might as well say that in case you're looking for one. I've even seen some at the dollar store that you can get. Just do it because it's so convenient and incredibly safe. If you're doing this over and over again, it's just super annoying to me. I don't know how you can do this for an entire ride, but also it's just incredibly unsafe. Just get a phone mount. It's not even just Uber and Lyft 101. It's just driving 101 because everybody uses their phone and even more so, everybody uses their phone GPS. The pregame hours really solved a massive dilemma that I had for a while as a driver. Maybe you do as well. And that is this, Friday and Saturday nights. On one end, I can drive on a Friday and Saturday night and make a good amount of money, as we all know. 
But on the other end, I want to go out with my friends. And I was caught between the Savama. And then I discovered the beauty of the pregame hours. Now, I find the pregame hours are really the time when most people are going to their friend's place to then start pregaming and getting ready for the night. So this is about, I'd say about 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on a Friday and Saturday. And the beauty of this is that one, I could drive during the pregame hours, you know, pick people, up, pick people up, drop people off, and still be able to go out with my friends. In addition, in case you didn't know, I'm a DJ electronic music producer. So if I had a DJ gig, no big deal. I would drive for like an Uber, make that money during the pregame hours, and then be able to go out and DJ that night. And what's cool about the pregame hours is two things. One, I actually found, and I'm not making this up, I could sometimes make the same exact amount of money, if not more, driving during the pregame hours than on a Friday and Saturday night. My theory, again, this is just a guess, my theory is maybe because there's not as many drivers on the road, because a lot of people don't really think about that. Maybe that's why I made so much money. And two, if you don't want to deal with the drunk people, you don't want to deal with someone potentially puking in your car or whatever, the pregame hours are a perfect time to drive. And a huge pro tip I'll give on top of this is like say on a Friday, what I actually would do is start around, it's a 3 p.m. I found that on Friday, some people like say had half days, people might get out of work a bit earlier than normal. So I'd start driving at 3 p.m. Around 5-ish p.m. is a massive peak because then people are actually leaving work at the average time. And then from about 5-ish p.m. to then 9 p.m., people are like, hey, I'm going from work maybe right to the bar or I'm going to get picked up at 6 p.m. because I'm going to go to my friend's place to start pre-gaming and then we're going out. Do not underestimate the pre-game hours. Again, I'd say maybe about 5 or 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., maybe even 10 p.m. It's a great time to make a lot of money and you don't have to deal with drunk people. This is a big one and that is say the name. I mentioned this in my video of 25 tips for new drivers. I will link this below in the description if you want to watch that video. Overall though, it comes down to this. When someone gets in your car, always say their name. Make sure you're picking up the right person and the best way to do that is to ask them, hey, Jessica, Tom, and to have them confirm it. The reason why I say this, and I've mentioned the story before, my first ever ride, first ever ride, it was with Lyft, and I picked up the wrong person. The reason why is two people, two girls, ordered a lift at the exact same time, at the exact same location, and it turns out, just given my luck, I ended up picking up the wrong one. So I guess in a good blessing in disguise way, it taught me every time since that first ever ride that I went to pick somebody up, even if I'm like, all right, who else is gonna order a lift at the exact same time, at the exact same location? Well. Given my luck, that did happen. I'm gonna make sure that every time someone gets in the car, I'm like, wait, Mike, Kyle, whatever the name is, make sure they confirm it. Make sure you know you're picking up the right person and you're good to go. This is a super important one because when you drive for Lyft and you drive for Uber, you are your own boss, which is awesome, right? There's so many pros to that. But on the other end, you are your own boss. If you don't drive, if you don't make enough money, no person is gonna come after you besides maybe your bill collectors saying, hey, you only did two rides this week. You should have done five, whatever the case is. So one huge pro tip I give to a lot of drivers is to set a quota. Now I find for a lot of drivers, there are three different ways that they do this. First is you say, okay, I'm gonna do X amount of rides a day. So you might say, look, I'm gonna do 10 rides every day, whether they're short or they're long, 10 rides is my quota. The second quota you can set is time. So you could say, for example, I'm gonna drive four hours every day, two hours in the morning commutes, because the peak hours, two hours in the evening commutes, peak hours again, which equals four hours total. The third way you could set a quota, and this is my personal favorite, is doing a certain amount every day. So you say, look, I'm gonna drive, no matter how long or short it takes, I'm gonna drive until I get to $50, for example. And that was for me, actually, when I drove in Boston, that was my quota every day. The main reason why, little fun fact or side note, Lyft was the first app that allowed you to do instant cash outs. Meaning you could drive and hit a button and instantly have that money in your bank account. I still remember the day it came out and I was like, 
this is like revolutionary. I mean, I don't have to wait a week to get paid. I can get paid instantly. Like, that's crazy, right? And right in the beginning, right when it started, their quota was $50. And they charged you two quarters or 50 cents to withdraw it. I don't know why specifically 50 cents exactly. So what I do is I would drive and the second I cracked over that $50 amount, I would cash out, which equal, if you did that every single day for a month, roughly about $1,500. So I'd expect to get about $1,500 from Uber and Lyft. And then of course I'd make money from DJ gigs, my music, YouTube, so on and so forth. So my best advice, especially for a lot of the beginning drivers, like I said earlier in this video, that because you're your own boss, there's so many benefits, but also if let's say you don't drive and you're slacking off because hey, there's no boss looking over you saying you have to drive. And then all of a sudden you're like, shoot, I was relying on a left and Uber for paying this bill or whatever. And now you can't pay it. That is going to be an issue, especially to stay self-motivated when driving to make sure you're hitting your marks. Always set a quota. Hire a tax accountant. Now I know tax season's upon us right now, at least at the exact time of this video. And I know a lot of people are like, hey, Mark, I'm going to go to Uber and Lyft. They have deals on tax software. I'm just gonna use TurboTax or another tax software. Do not do it. The reason why is when it comes to taxes, and for me, in case you don't know, I'm a former accountant, but I do wanna say I'm a former accountant, but I'm not your accountant. Just gotta say that. Everybody's situation is different. So on these tax softwares, they kind of give you like a generalization when it comes to your deductions and all the itemized deductions you're gonna be taking. Remember, because you are an independent contractor, driving for uber and lyft you do what's called itemized deductions as opposed to a standard deduction in plain speak your taxes are more complicated and part of that is the fact that you're going to do what's called write-offs so all the expenses you're going to incur during the year you're going to be writing them off and each type of expense has its own kind of unique financial model of how much you can write off when it comes to that specific expense if this sounds a bit complicated and tricky that's because in a lot of cases it is and it can be very overwhelming even for me even for me as a former accountant i still hire a tax accountant to do my taxes i pay him 250 dollars to do my taxes and i promise you yes well 250 is more than using a tax software even with the uber and lyft discount i save way more money overall because he knows exactly my financial situation and he knows exactly what to write off, how to write it off, and he can figure out all the details that a traditional tax software is just gonna overlook. Because remember, when it comes to your taxes, there is a gray area in a lot of situations. And when it comes to tax softwares, they take the safest bet. They're like, look, we don't know about this and this, so we're just gonna say you can write off this amount. But when it comes to a tax accountant, they can analyze that gray area a lot more specifically and say, oh, you know what? You wouldn't do this and this, but because of this that you're doing, you can write off this amount. You can write off this much more than a traditional tax software. At the end of the day, especially because you are an independent contractor, make sure you hire a tax accountant. It's one of the most important things any driver can do. You gotta do, and that is doing the big commute. What I mean is, if let's say you live in a state and you're in a very smaller town or smaller area in that state, you are way better off commuting all the way to a big city and driving that big city as opposed to just staying where you are. For example, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, right by Springfield. And as you can imagine, after I moved to Boston, that's when I started driving for Lyft and Uber, and you make a good amount of money driving for Lyft and Uber in Boston. And any single time I go back home to visit my parents and I'm talking to some of the drivers there, they're like, oh, you know what? I mean, I make some side cash in there, but the money's not really that good because it's Springfield. And in my mind, I'm like, well, why not commute to Boston? Like, yeah, between Springfield and Boston, you're looking about an hour and a half to two hours, which again, is a far commute. However, let's say that four-ish hour round trip, if you're gonna do it, you're gonna make so much more money just by making that commute to Boston. Again, it's gonna suck. It's gonna be annoying to drive two hours there and then two hours back. But let's say you wake up, you know, 9 or 10 a.m. on a Friday, you drive two hours to Boston, you drive, let's say, all day and night, maybe you crash somewhere in Boston, however you want to do it, maybe you drive for the weekend, and then come back to Springfield. You are so much better off doing the commute. And I know, nobody likes commuting. 
Let's be honest, because in a sense, you're not making any money, right? Those two hours, or in this case, four hours, there and back, you're making nothing. However, you're way better off not making any money for four hours and then driving in Boston because you're gonna make way more money overall. The only caveat to this pro tip I will say is remember that if you wanna, let's say, go over a state border, there's a lot of tricky rules and regulations and whatnot that come into play. When what I mean is, let's say you live in a very small area and the big city closest to you is only 20 minutes away, but it's across the state border or across a state line here in America, contact Lyft and Uber. I do know, I think they do do some kind of deals where you are able to drive in two different states if there's some unique situation there. But again, I don't remember all the specific red tape and it's a gray area. So definitely contact them. But in either situation, whether you, you don't want to commute to a big city in a different state, or you just want to commute to a big city in your same state, the big drive, even if it's 20 minutes, 40 minutes, two hours, four hours round trip, you're going to make significantly more money always driving in a bigger city. Check your tires. I know this is driving 101, but especially when you're driving for Uber and Lyft, you're going to be on the road more. It just makes sense, right? And and too many people don't check their tires enough, especially if you live in an area with a very tough climate, like Boston, Chicago, whatever, where there's a lot of potholes. You're going to be driving in the snow a lot. You know, having a lot less air in your tires can easily equal a higher chance in accidents. Like, say, if you're driving and you hit a pothole, your, your tire's not properly filled, that equals maybe a flat tire right then and there, which makes you lose out on potentially a few hours of work at least. Just make sure that maybe every two to three weeks, it doesn't have to be like a crazy thing, but every two to three weeks when you stop at the gas station, just check your tires and refill them if necessary. Focus driving on Saturday and Sunday mornings. This is a great pro tip for a few different reasons. One, you don't have to drive around drunk people. I feel like that alone is a big thing a lot of drivers are trying to look at where they're like, oh, I wanna drive on a Friday night, because it's high surges, but I don't want people being drunk, puking my car, et cetera, et cetera. The truth is, there's been some times I've driven on a Saturday morning where the surges were higher than a Saturday night. There were some times where I drove on a Sunday morning that the surges were higher on a Friday or Saturday night. It does depend weekend to weekend, especially, let's say, if there's events going on, if there's other stuff going on but the biggest thing is a lot of people are taking an uber and a lift saturday and sunday morning maybe they're going out for like a sunday fun day they're going somewhere fun to do something during the day or let's say which happens a lot people let's say crash at their friend's place on a friday or saturday night they wake up and they're like all right that was a good night let me get an uber back let me get a lift back this is great like i said for two reasons one you don't have to drive around drunk people and two the surges can sometimes be just as high if not higher than a friday or saturday night one thing I do want to say, because I like to be very transparent in all my videos, is to still always have puke bags or something in your car. Here's the reason why I say that. I've personally never had someone puke in my car when I was driving. Not even once. Not even one issue. However, one of my friends, her second ever ride, second ever ride was on a Saturday morning, and a girl got in her car who definitely had a bit of a crazy night the night previously. She was driving, and the girl said to her, like, Oh my God, I might puke, do you mind pulling over? And luckily nothing got in the car and my friend had to keep pulling over because this girl kept having to puke. Now that is a very, very unique and rare situation, but I do like to be transparent on camera that you never know, sometimes on a Saturday or Sunday morning, someone's super hungover or whatever, you might get those kind of people, but 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just somebody who's like, Oh, and they're like this the whole time. Well, you could tell they're definitely not happy about going that hard the night before or whatever. But I'm telling you, Saturday and Sunday mornings, absolutely key to not drive around drunk people and be able to make sometimes even more money than a Friday or Saturday night. This is a very specific one, but I really want to go all in on this. And that is have a two way filming dash cam. I've already done a bunch of videos about dash cams. I even mentioned dash cams as its own pro tip. And I have gotten some comments and questions saying, hey, Mark, I'm curious, when driving, should the dash cam record outside of your vehicle in case, like, say, an accident happens or inside your vehicle in case there's an altercation with a passenger, et cetera, et cetera? And my answer every time is, well, both. And I know a lot of people then say, well, if you had to pick one, 
But my answer is still both. The reason why there are dash cams, of course, that just film one direction, but there's also dash cams that film in both directions, and that is the dash cam you should get. I've even seen some drivers get two dash cams, one filming the outside of the vehicle, one filming the inside. That works too. The biggest thing is remember that when you're on the road, and it's just statistics, like I've mentioned in other videos, you are more likely to get into some type of altercation. Whether that's outside of your vehicle, like say in an accident or whatever, or inside your vehicle with a passenger, like say, and this is very rare, but it does happen, like say they try attacking you, or like say they're trying to do something malicious in your car, not just to you, but to your surroundings. There was one video that went viral of a bunch of girls stealing all the money from the driver's tip jar and he did have it on dash cam footage to prove his point. Let's say there's a dispute between you and a passenger. Well, guess what? There is the footage right there to show Lyft and Uber saying, hey, we had an altercation, nothing extreme happened, but it was a verbal altercation. Here's the unedited video. And when it comes to dash cam footage, I look at it just like insurance. Hopefully you never have to use it, but it's there for both the outside and the inside of your car in case you need it. Valvoline oil change. I wanna stress right in the beginning, they did not ask me to make this video. I'm not getting any money, no kickbacks, no bonuses, nothing. I just wanted to make this video because the more that you start driving, you're gonna to have to get, as you can imagine, more maintenance on your car. Whether you're doing delivery driving, ride your driving, or a combination of the two, there has to be more maintenance. And one huge aspect to that is oil changes. And I travel a lot. I am constantly on the road and there are a ton of companies. You can do a quick Google search to find oil changes in your area, whether it's like a chain or a dealership or whatever. And I gotta say, after trying tons of them, Valvoline oil change is by far the best. And I wanna stress, like I said, I have zero affiliation with them. I just really want to make this video because I still remember the first time I went there it was super quick. You stay in your car as opposed to other places you have to get out. You wait in that kind of weird small lobby area with like one random coffee pot and like five magazines. So in this case, you stay in your car, you drive up, they do everything right then and there. The oil change is very quick. Of course, they do check other parts of your car just to make sure everything's running correctly. But in addition, it's also cheaper. So it's quicker and cheaper than almost any other place out there. And what's good about this is if let's say you're driving, that oil light comes on, all you need to do is pull up Google Maps. This is what I do. Find the nearest Valvoline oil change. Go right there. It might take you 20 or 30 minutes, depending on if this other car is waiting to get one as well. You pull right in. You don't even have to get out of your car. You don't have to spend a ton of money for that oil change. You get it. You get back out on the road and you're good to go. Vlogging. Now I know it. First you're like, wait, you're talking about like vlog as in like YouTube videos? What does that have anything to do with Uber and Lyft? In case you don't know, there are an insane amount of searches every day on both Google, YouTube, and other search engines for things about Lyft and Uber. And especially when it comes down to videos about Uber and Lyft. I mean, hey, I have this entire channel dedicated to Uber and Lyft. And in case you didn't know as well, the ads that go on Uber and Lyft videos are very high paying. This could be a whole other subject for a whole other video, but a thousand views on YouTube are not created equal. There's a lot of myths, like for every thousand views, you get X amount of dollars, or for every million views, you get this amount. Not the case. For some niches, you get maybe $4 for every thousand views. For other ones, it's higher. It really depends on the niche itself. When it comes to Uber and Lyft, and I'm not exaggerating, I get on this exact channel around 15 or $16 for every 1,000 views. If you look at other channels, like some of my other ones, because I have nine different YouTube channels, in case you didn't know, on some of the other channels, I maybe get three or $4 for every 1,000 views. So when it comes to Uber and Lyft content, one, it's very popular, and two, it's very high paying. And my biggest suggestion for every driver out there is start a YouTube channel, and I'm not exaggerating, just vlog. Every day, maybe say, hey, you know what? Here's how things went today. Here's how much money I made. I had this one passenger who did X, Y, and Z. Here was a funny story from driving last night on a Friday night, et cetera, et cetera. I know drivers who I suggested to do this and they started doing it. They started making videos about what it was like being a driver and they contacted me saying, hey, Mark, I'm now 
actually making like a good amount from this YouTube channel, just talking about Uber and Lyft stories than I am from driving. If anything, it's now becoming a comparable income. When I started driving in 2015, I started making a lot of Uber and Lyft videos. I was one of the first, and this is again years ago on a different channel, but I was one of the first Uber and Lyft YouTubers and I was a little lucky. I will say that. I was kind of lucky where I was at the right place, the right time. No one really had made any videos about Uber and Lyft yet. I started making a bunch. And those YouTube videos about Uber and Lyft started paying more than me driving. And then I was like, wait a minute. Why not just keep making a lot more videos in addition to driving? And then it got to the point where I started making pretty much all my money from YouTube because I fell in love with making videos. And then the rest is history. I'll definitely do a video in the future going more in depth about this, but I want to put this as a pro tip because it's a great way to make side cash. And like I said, it doesn't have to be this crazy production. I film all these videos with my iPhone. All you need to do, honestly, if I was in your shoes, is you need to get done with a bunch of rides, maybe just sit in your car, because I kind of I think the car environment is really good for like a cinematic viewpoint, right? Because you're talking about Uber and Lyft. Have your phone set up and just be like, hey. So on this video of Uber vlog number 37, I picked up this guy, he went here, this was like, and all you have to do is just explain what happened that day. And you may be thinking, well, Mark, no one's really gonna watch me just talk about what my rides were like. Yes, they will. I promise you, yes, they will. And I think this is honestly one of the most underrated niches on YouTube that not a lot of people have made content about. Like on this channel, I prefer making videos that are more educational, right? I give you tips about how to make more money. I talk about the Uber and Lyft requirements. I talk about ride share insurance, right? More educational knowledge about ride sharing. However, there's a whole other aspect when it comes to entertainment videos about funny stories, weird things that happened, you know, showing your income statements and everything. That's a big thing. And by making these kind of videos, you can get a lot of money from them and they can be a lot of fun to make as well. Again, as weird as it sounds, coming from a very like left field perspective, because it may seem super random, making vlog videos about Uber and Lyft, how things are going when it comes to driving, dealing with passengers, and a lot more is a great way to make a lot of money. This is something you may start noticing over time, especially if you study the analytics, which I always suggest you do. That's the number one best tip I have to make the most amount of money with Uber and Lyft. Look at the analytics, and that is wait, and bank. What I mean is sometimes, and you have to kind of plan it out and look at the analytics, look at where you are in all these different metrics. Sometimes by waiting to take a ride, you can make more money. Basically, you wait a little bit and then you can make bank. This is something I noticed in Boston that when I first started driving, I noticed that the peak morning hours were 7 to 9 a.m. Not too surprising, right? People get to work around 9 a.m., then a lot of these surges, a lot of the people ordering Ubers and Lyfts just almost drops off because everyone's trying to get to work. And what I noticed, probably not too surprising, is I'd go from, like, say, a residential area to the general area of Boston in the heart of the city where people were going to work. I typically did this trip about two, maybe three times. But when you're talking about traffic and going back and forth and everything, that was my typical pattern is going from the residential areas to the main area of Boston for people to go to work. And what I noticed is, let's say it was 8 a.m., I was actually better off waiting, maybe canceling rides or just turning the app off, waiting till about, I don't know, let's say like 8.20 usually was like the best time. Sometimes around 8.15, 8.15, 8.20, I would then start accepting rides because at that time, the surging would be higher. So if I took a ride at 8 a.m. and I bring somebody to the city, let's say, and I drop them off, by that point, let's say it's 8 a.m., I drop them off around like 8.30 because of traffic. By that point, it's kind of tough to get a ride in the heart of Boston because a lot of people are just trying to get into the heart of Boston in the morning. So by waiting, I sometimes would make double as if I took that same exact ride at 8 a.m. because around 8.20, the surges are way higher. A lot of people are like, shoot, I got to get to work. I'm running late. It's already 8.20 or 8.25 or 8.30. I got to get there, whatever the cost of that Uber or that Lyft is, I got to do it because I got to get to work. So I found off I was better off waiting. Another way to use the wait and bank technique 
is around big search pockets. I've already done a pro tip video about this. I call them hot spots. So let's say any train station, a bus station, uh, the airport potentially, depending on your area, depending on what's going on. But all these places are really, really good options because let's say you just did a great ride, you drop somebody off and you notice, oh wow, the, uh, the bus station, the train station, that main area that's dedicated to people traveling and bouncing around and moving around, well, if it's, let's say, seven minutes from you, you're actually probably better off waiting, maybe turning off the app, depending on, like, say, if you're trying to get an acceptance rate and you want to get that bonus. You know, obviously, if you're trying to get a bonus, this is something you have to kind of weigh out. You're probably better off waiting to get a ride, maybe canceling rides or just kind of ignoring the app, getting to that general area. Again, whether it's a train station, bus station, that general traveling building, that's the right word, and then accepting rides because those rides typically not always but typically will get you more money because it might be higher surge and people may be going a farther distance when it comes to them traveling now this is just two examples of the weight and bank option but i promise you if you look at the general analytics and the layout of your city you could potentially make significantly more money by waiting for rides i just gave you two examples again whether it's waiting for the timing of that ride because a lot of people are trying to get to work or from work or trying to get somewhere and two going to that main hot spot but those are just two examples when i first started driving i just took any ride that they gave to me i didn't think anything of it i was like hey i'm driving for lyft and uber i'm just gonna accept every ride they give me right why not that's kind of the the point of being a ride show driver but the more i drove the more i realized that timing out and being smart and planning when to accept that ride or when to deny it especially too is sometimes even more important to make a lot of money waiting for the right ride is one of the best ways to make bank when driving for Lyft and Uber this is a great pro tip for two different reasons and what you do is during the ride I'd say mostly in the beginning you ask what route should I take or just in general say hey is there any preferred route you want should I go this way or this way you can give give them a couple options or just ask overall, is there any route or any road you would like me to take? Here's why this works really well. One, it's great customer service, right? It's good for your rating if you just say, hey, I want to give you the best ride possible. I don't know if there's any particular road, highway, route you would like me to take. The second reason though, and to me, this is the, the bigger one, is it's a great way to start a conversation. Now, I already did a video about how to have amazing conversations with passengers. I really like this below in the description if you want to watch it. And one big thing I say is when someone gets in the car, it's very common for you to say, hey, how are you? How's your day? It's a kind of a cliche thing that everyone does. It's like a common courtesy. And sometimes it's tough to tell like, okay, does this person want to talk or not? Like usually sometimes you can tell if they're like very talkative or if they go right to their phone, you can tell they don't want to talk. But sometimes it's a bit of a gray area. Now, this is a great question because it's not too invasive. You're not saying, so uh, uh, what do you do for work? Or something that you can tell is just a way to try to get a conversation started. This is a very common logistical question that's a very understandable thing to ask. If, let's say, someone gets in the car, you can't tell if they're talkative or not. You start driving and you say, hey, so uh, just curious, it's taking me down Converse Street. Does that work for you or is there any route you prefer? You know, just let me know in case it's a specific road you want me to take. Now, they could, at that point, give you a suggestion and then go to their phone. You're like, all right, they definitely don't want to talk. But they might say, hey, you know what? About this time, take, I don't know, Bradwick Road because that way is a little bit easier to go down because of this, this, and this. And they start talking. Then you can build a conversation on top of that and say, oh, yeah, you know, I know what you mean. Like, it, it's weird how sometimes it goes back and forth. You know, being here in LA, the traffic is crazy sometimes. And I found this road is actually a little bit easier too, even though Google Maps says this and this. And then, you know, the ball starts rolling and now you can actually have a conversation. So again, this is a great pro tip. And right when someone gets in the car, like I said, one, hi, how are you? is a very cliche thing to say. But two, asking what route or if there's any preferred route is great. So that way you have great customer service in terms of, asking them the best way to go but two starting off that conversation or throwing out that breadcrumb to see if a conversation forms from that window lock now if you haven't driven on friday and saturday nights yet as you can imagine you're typically dealing with drunk people 
And for me, I actually preferred driving drunk people way more than sober people. I feel like it was more upbeat. People were a lot more excited to go out, etc., etc. However, one thing that I did not expect, I really did not expect this as a driver, and especially driving around drunk people, is them rolling down the windows. Now, sometimes they want to get fresh air. Sometimes they just are super hot and they want to roll down the window to get some fresh air. But I'd say like 80 or 90% of the time, they're going to do something dumb. It's usually them rolling it down, screaming at somebody, or just saying something obnoxious or whatever. So what I always did on Friday and Saturday nights is turn window lock on. In case you don't know, by the way, might as well say this as a quick side note. Window lock disables anybody in the car besides you from rolling down the windows. So what I do is I'd have that on on Friday and Saturday nights. And let's say someone's like, hey man, I'm trying to roll down the window. Like what's going on? I'd usually one, assess the situation. Are they pretty sober? Are they drunk? Can I maybe tell that they're trying to do something dumb? And then two, I'd be like, all right, well, wait, wait. Why do you want to roll down the window? Like, I, I gotta know, I gotta know. And sometimes you're like, oh man, I just need some fresh air. Okay, I would turn window lock off, they'd roll it down. But other times they'd be like, oh, well, you know, I, um, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, if you're gonna do something dumb, nope, I'm not rolling down the windows. So I kind of make a joke out of it because you're way better off having window lock on and then trying to figure out why they want to roll down the window as opposed to like say it's off, they start doing something dumb, they throw stuff out of your car. I mean, you never know. And granted, these are kind of far and few situations, but I'm telling you, this is one of those things that I really did not expect as a driver of how many people wanted to roll down the window on a Friday and Saturday night. Like so many people. And also too, before I did the window lock technique, I had a few roll down the window and start screaming something. And I'm like, oh my God. And I roll it back up. And then they try rolling it back down again. And it turns into this kind of passive aggressive thing where I'm trying to keep that window up. They're trying to keep it down. I'm like, all right, now we have a situation. So I have to say something, you know, obviously it would always be fun and kind of make a joke out of it, but it is a cool pro tip. I will say, just trust me, if you're driving on Friday and Saturday nights, or maybe even during the day, like let's say some music festival or something where you know people can be intoxicated, just have window lock on, trust me.